Hello, my name is Chin Manirke. Uh, this is the ICCS 2022 version of our talk, a circuit lower bounds for low energy states of code Hamiltonians. This is joint work with Anurag Anshu, who while the work was being completed, was at UC Berkeley and is now a professor at Harvard. The starting point for this talk is the complexity of low energy states for local Hamiltonians. While ground states of local Hamiltonians are known to be these highly entangled non-classical objects that simultaneously capture universal quantum computation and describe quantum mechanics, the complexity of their low energy counterparts is sort of strange. Ground states are these amazing mathematical objects which sort of bridge our understanding of computer science and physics, and yet their low energy counterparts which are more physically realizable are something we don't have as good mathematical understanding of. So an overarching goal of what we wanna do in this line of research is we wanna understand the complexities of these higher energy state systems. How entangled are they? How non-classical are there? And do they capture universal quantum computation? These questions are interconnected to a variety of questions in quantum complexity theory, ranging from the quantum PCP conjecture to more practical ideas on constructions of quantum devices. Uh, but today we'll focus on very simple, very small section of that research world. And I, I will sort of mathematically make these kind of more broad points rigorous. So to get a little bit more technical, we start by thinking about the almost a decade old conjecture now by Friedman and Hastings called the NLTS conjecture or no low energy trivial states conjecture, which states that there should exist local Hamiltonians for which every state of low energy is highly entangled and non-classical. And I will in due course be specific as to what it means to be low energy, what it means to be highly entangled and what it means to be non-classical. At a high level though, this NLTS conjecture is stating a property that we expect is contained by some local Hamiltonians, but this is not a property you expect of your garden variety local Hamiltonians. So sort of the physically realizable local Hamiltonians we naturally think about will not have this property. And yet we expect that these properties should be mathematically constructible of some family of local Hamiltonians, which is why it's sort of this very fascinating problem because it connects sort of the engineering of local Hamiltonians to notions of physical physicality. What these Hamiltonians will have as properties is they will have no classical approximations to their ground state. And you could think of them in the following sense that a state that was brought from a ground state where it's highly entangled up to room temperature will still preserve some of these notions of high entanglement that we wish to see. Our goal is to be precise in these things and prove for a certain definition of highly entangled and non-classical such as the statement. More specifically, we're gonna use the notion of circuit depth as a measure of entanglement and, and non-classicality or more generally complexity. And what we will show is a circuit depth lower bound for every low energy state for a certain family of local Hamiltonians. The family of local Hamiltonians we'll be interested in are arising from error correcting codes. So you might look at this talk if you're interested in just error correction theory or coding theory, or you might look at this in terms of a more general quantum complexity perspective. And I hope that people from both kind of crowds gain something from this talk. So now the very technical mathematical statement is the following. So if you consider a stabilizer quantum error correcting code, so that is a quantum error correcting code whose check terms are all defined by stabilizer uh, um, matrices or pa Pauli matrices, um, and let's C be an N KD code, so N being the number of physical qubits, K being the number of logical qubits, and D be a ratio distance. Then, if you consider the local Hamiltonian that corresponds to this code, so there's one local term which checks for every code, every code term, whether it's being satisfied or not, then what we get is that for any low energy state, rho, so low energy here being an epsilon fraction of the total energy, the total energy, of course, being on the order of n. Then the circuit depth of rho scales at least with log of d 
and log of this other term, which I will state in a second. And let's note that log of d is sort of the optimal answer we could get because we know that for stabilizer error correcting codes, there exists ground states of log d circuit depth. Now, the part that's missing here uh, is the following. It's actually based on the rate. So we get that when the code is high rate, so when the rate of the code is on the order of n, we get a circuit lower bound that's non-trivial for energy almost a constant fraction. And actually, we can actually strengthen this result to be of the following, where it's either the rate or the distance needs to be good in order for us to get a circuit lower bound. But for the interest of this talk, we will only focus on the simplified version of the statement, where it's just log k over n here. But if you are interested in the full version, you can uh, read our paper where you'll see how it's log k plus d. So it, another way of looking at this result is through examples. And it, here's a simple example that if you have a linear rate code, so where that's where the rate k scales with n, but the distance need not be actually linear. It could be polynomial distance. A simple example being like the telic Zimor codes. Then for all states of energy on the order of n to the point 99, so just slightly sublinear, then the circuit complexity of those states scales like log n. So it's up to a constant factor optimal. Another way of writing this is that if the energy is like little of n, then the circuit complexity is super constant. So a little context in terms of prior work, that we had prior to this result known of a circuit lower bound for all low energy states um, that was a, that was non-trivial other than for the small energy gap of order n to the negative two, and this result follows from some from the work of Kitayev on circuit to Hamiltonian clock construction. Log n depth lower bounds were known for very restricted subclasses of low energy states, such as epsilon error states by work on by Eldar and Harrow and myself. Uh, with Umesh Vazrani and Henry Yuan, or one-sided error by the original authors of the NLTS conjecture, Gibbs states, and D2 symmetry. So to contextualize our result, this might be illustrative to think about some example codes for which our lower bounds actually hold. The first one is one I just mentioned a second ago, that being the telic z more hypergraph product code. These are codes for which the rate is linear to distance scales like square root of n, in which case we're able to prove lower bounds um, as previously stated, of log n for any state of energy n to the point 99 or less. Another interesting and non-trivial example is the puncture torque code, where we puncture an almost linear number of holes, in this case, n to the 1 minus delta, where delta is a small constant. If you do puncture this hole, it's not a difficult mathematical exercise to realize the rate is also almost linear and the distance is polynomial. So what you get is a circuit lower bound that scales with delta times log n for all states of almost linear energy. A sort of surprising result because we don't expect the sort of complexity to exist in such a two-dimensional code. In fact, we know for a fact that states uh, that sit on a two-dimensional lattice like the puncture torque code cannot be the complete NLTS theorem. I recognize that I haven't formally stated what the NLTS theorem is, sorry, excuse me, NLTS conjecture is, and I will state that in due course. A third example code is one that's very recent, which is the Pantelev Kalachev LDCC codes from just last year, um, which are codes of linear rate and linear distance. Unfortunately, the result that we are able to prove is only a constant factor better for the Pantelev College has LDPC codes than it is for the Telix Seymour hypergraph product codes. And there isn't actually a order of magnitudes uh, better lower bound we're able to prove. A inter very interesting thing, um, future work, is to try to understand if there is something to be gained from their construction that actually strengthens the arguments we're presenting today and actually is able to prove the NLTS conjecture. Perhaps before we go on to how we prove our result or contextualize it more in terms of the quantum PCB conjecture, it's illustrative to first think about why the result is surprising. Quantum error correcting codes are designed to correct discrete errors defined by the physical qubits. They are not designed in mind, or at least 
the original formulation by Shore for error correction did not have in mind the sort of undiscrete errors that are errors analogous to low energy states. In contrast, what we actually show is that despite the definition not handling such continuous errors, low energy states, which violate these kind of clauses fractionally, and these are larger kind of energy errors and cannot be defined discreetly, are still analyzable using the definition of error correction and have interesting quantum properties. And by doing so, we show that the discretized model for error correction may have more benefit in the non-discrete model than we had previously thought. So to contextualize the problem, let's look back at the quantum PCP conjecture. So the quantum PCP conjecture is a nice pictorial example where let's start with n qubits, this sitting on a line, but then you don't see it in a line, where we have Hamiltonian terms H1 and H2. These terms, again, need not act on the line, just act on some constant number of terms each. Given that there is a mathematical Hermitian operator, the local Hamiltonian operator, which is the sum of these local terms, and it acts on n qubits. And for every local Hamiltonian, there is a value, the minimum energy, which is the infimum over all states of trace H5. And now a simple computational question is given a description of each of these local Hamiltonians and which qubits it acts on, how hard is it to compute E up to some accuracy epsilon? And it's well known um, by Kitaev that when the epsilon that you're trying to calculate the accuracy to is one over N squared, then this problem of computing E is QMA hard. And uh, Kitaev's original result had it for one over N cubed, but then uh, following results have actually improved that to one over N squared. The quantum PCP conjecture says it's actually hard to act, compute it even when the epsilon is on the order of N. And um, for references, you can look at the wonderful survey by Ahernov, Arad, and Vitek. So this problem, the quantum PCP conjecture has been around for almost 20 years now. And in some ways we are no closer to solving it now than we were when we started. It is a problem that eludes and excites us in the community all the time. But there was a simplification of this problem called the NLTS conjecture, the no low energy trivial states conjecture, which tried to grab at a very simple property of the quantum PCP conjecture and we state this now because even this conjecture has been open for almost a decade. To preface the NLTS conjecture, we first have to formalize what we mean by circuit depth just by having talked about it for almost five minutes now. So for any given state psi, the circuit depth of psi is the minimum depth when you get to stack two qubit local gates where the gates can be any two qubit unitary, say, and any connectivity, even though I pictorially I've drawn this two dimensionally, but any connectivity, um, such that once you trace out some fraction of the qubits, the resulting state is exactly psi on those registers. The NLCS conjecture says that there exists some fixed constant epsilon, think like one over 100, and a family of local Hamiltonians, H, which act on n qubits, such that for all states of low energy, so all states of energy less than one over 100 of the total, say, if epsilon is one over 100, that the circuit complexity of those states must be super constant. Super constant meaning that it scales with n and it's not a, a fixed constant. So pictorially, it's something like this, that when states are uh, low energy, you know, the complexity is super constant, and up to some barrier, it stays super constant. And then after that, you know, doesn't matter. And that, that's sort of what has to be because all states have some energy somewhere, right? So well, as I'll show in a second, the NLTS conjecture is a necessary consequence of the quantum PCP conjecture. And in, in, in many ways, it's much easier because it separates the robustness of entanglement question of the NLTS uh, of the quantum PCP conjecture 
from the hardness of computation aspect. Quantum PCP is the statement both about computation at the same time quantum complexity. Here, the NLCS question note has nothing to do with computation. The Hamiltonians need not be physically relevant for any sort of computational task. They just are Hamiltonians that possess some notion of robust entanglement, entanglement which persists even at a low energy state. And in some sense, it asks about the ability to conduct quantum computation at room temperature. Uh, can I produce a Hamiltonian so that even if I let the system thermalize, the states that remain after thermalization are still complex and entangled. So our result in the context of NLTS is a circuit lower bound for a specific family of local Hamiltonians. Note that this NLTS conjecture asks for circuit lower bounds for all states of energy less, less than some fixed constant. And our lower bound uh, has a scaling with the constant epsilon. So we are unable to achieve the exact parameters of the NLTS conjecture, but we get something that is arbitrarily close. And in some sense, a small improvement on our result would be enough to prove the NLTS conjecture. So part two of this talk, now that we've sort of set up the goal of what our result is and contextualize it in terms of the NLTS conjecture, is to first prove the basic setup that will allow us to mathematically um, show our result, at least show a version of our result for the purposes of this talk. So one more time, circuit complexity uh, is the minimum depth of any circuit that exactly produces a state rho. And some simple facts about circuit complexity is that if the circuit complexity is less than one, if and only if the state is a tensor product state. simple other fact that we'll use is that if you have a constant locality Hamiltonian and a state of low circuit complexity, here is going to be some complexity T, where T is a small number, then there's a classical algorithm for exactly computing the energy of that state rho with respect to that Hamiltonian H in time that scales polynomially in the number of qubits and doubly exponential in T. The idea is that we're going to show that each term of the Hamiltonian HI rho H being a linear sum of them, so it's just so the trace of H rho is just the sum of trace H I rho, will only depend on the reduced computation on order two to the t qubits. And if there's order two to the t qubits, then that can be classically simulated in time two to the two to the t. So that's the rough sketch, and we'll show that in a second. To show that, uh, we need to first introduce the notion of light cones. So a light cone is a very simple idea. So it says basically the following: that if I had indicate a wire I, then the light cone of that wire is all the wires for which there is an information propagation. So you can see that if given this wire I that's drawn here, all the wires corresponding to the output of one of these gray gates could be could plausibly co be correlated with the value of the wire at I. A value at one of these non-gray uh, gates cannot be because information can only travel according to the propagation of the unitaries. So a simple property we can see is the size of the light cone is on the order of two to the T. Two just coming from the fact that we're talking about two qubit unitaries. If you were talking about three qubit unitaries, it would be three, right? That this these constants actually will not end up mattering in our talk. The second fact we're going to use is a sort of technical fact uh, about light cones which says that if I have a, a low depth circuit U, here U being of depth T, and I have a density matrix or any operator rho actually, if I wanna look at the value on the ith qubit of rho, so here my notation of trace minus i is means I'm gonna trace out all the qubits except for that ith qubit, then the value of this term can actually be simplified by just looking at the reduced density matrix of rho on that light cone Li. So re recall I is going to be the name of some wire or some qubit, and Li is going to be the set of qubits, which are its light cones. We'll provide this proof on the next page because this will be one of our two crucial theorems that we're going to use in our proof statement. <laughs> 
Okay, so how do we prove this thing? Well, it's actually not too difficult. Let's, there's a very nice pictorial proof that we'll see in a second. So let A be any operator that acts on the i's qubit. Okay, so then if I wanted to calculate the value of A acting on that i's qubit, I could write that as trace of A times the value on that i's qubit. And now using the fact that I know the trace of a partial trace, I can just write in this other form, right? And now I'm going to prove that this actually is equal to trace u dagger a u rho l i. So how do I do that? Well, let's first draw the first one. Let's draw a trace of u dagger a u rho. It looks like this. Here's rho on the outside. There's a in the middle, u dagger on one side, u on the other. And now let's notice that all the white gates are right across from their adjoint. They're, they're inverse, right? So they just cancel each other out. So all I'm left with is the gates that only acted on the light cone. And the reduce and rho, I'm taking the reduced density matrix on, which is exactly what the statement is. So I get the statement on the left. So this is a simple pictorial proof of the equations at the left. And now I can just undo this partial trace, right, and rewrite it this way. And since this holds for any operator A, I, I didn't have to do anything with regards to A, then fact two follows immediately. Okay, so this actually is enough for us to understand why the quantum piece speed conjecture implies NLTS. And previously, when I said it directly implies NLTS, I was kind of cheating a bit. It's modulo the well assumed state in NP does not equal QMA. So, how do we do this? Well, let's take the simplified version of the quantum PCP. You can do it for all technical versions that you want. And it, let's just say you're given a local Hamiltonian answering if minimum energy is exactly zero or greater than one over 10 n, let's assume that was QMA hard. And let's assume simultaneously that NLTS was false. It said for every epsilon greater than zero and every local Hamiltonian, there's a state of constant circuit complexity where the circuit complexity scales with epsilon. So it's like, you know, but for a fixed constant epsilon, there's a fixed constant of that low energy. And we're gonna show that these two statements together are going to imply QMA equals NP, which is going to be our contradiction. So what is the QMA proof um, that the minimum energy equals zero? Uh, well, you could just give a state rho such that trace of H rho equals zero, right? But instead of giving the state rho, which may be very complicated, that shows that the minimum energy is zero, because we assume the NLTS conjecture is false, we know there exists necessarily a state sigma whose circuit complexity is a constant and whose energy is less than one over 20 n. So this is just applying the epsilon equals one over 20 version of the NLTS conjecture. And let's let U be the defining circuit. And now my claim is that instead of sending the quantum state rho, which is a quantum object, a prover could instead just send you the classical description of the circuit U. Now U is a constant depth classical circuit. And now what do you do? Well, by the previous statement, if the U is a constant depth classical circuit, then we can calculate the energy of trace H sigma exactly in time that's polynomial in N. So if the minimum energy is zero, then we just classically check the trace of H rho, sorry, excuse me, trace of H sigma is less than one over 20 N. And conversely, if the minimum energy was at least one over 10 N, then it would state that for all U, for all circuits that are of constant depth that describe an answer, the trace of H sigma must be at least one over 10 N. So you wouldn't be able to fool me because I'd be able to calculate that. Therefore, instead of solving this QMA hard question that is defined in this quantum PCP, using quantum witnesses, we were able to solve it using only classical witnesses, which gets to the fact that QMA equals NP. And recall the, the crux is that because the depth of U is a constant. Okay, so just to recap, the, the two facts that were very useful for us and will be further useful is one, this notion of light cones, that the measurement of any term rho only depends on the value there. And this actually can be also used to show that statement I proved this, I stated a second ago about being able to calculate the energy of a local Hamiltonian um, 
for any concept circuit and polynomial time. The second thing we're going to need is something about error correcting codes, right? So far, we've only talked about low depth circuits, and that makes sense since we're going to talk about circuit lower bounds. But the second part has to do something with error correcting codes because our Hamiltonians are going to arise from error correcting codes. And the property we're going to be interested in is something we call local indistinguishability. So, local indistinguishability says the following Let S be a set of qubits uh, where the size of S is less than D the erasure distance. So the S you can think of as a correctable region. If an error occurred on S, there exists a method for correcting it. And this can be formalized using the Camille Laflamme conditions, which says that you can correct an error E if you if pi E pi is just a constant times pi, or pi is a projector out of the code space. But I think of this as very confusing and not at all intuitive. So let me try to give you a more intuitive understanding of the statement of local indistinguishability. So let S be a set of qubits so that S is a correctable region. Then for all code states rho, what it means is that rho when restricted to S, so that's when you trace out everything but the region S, is an invariant. No matter what code state you started off with rho, the value of the density matrix rho on just the region S is an invariant. Now, this is not a property of classical error correction. This is a property that is very strongly of quantum error correction. And maybe there's an, there's an intuitive way to think about it. So let's imagine that there was an erasure error that happened on the region S. So the region S sort of fell out of your pocket and you lost it. Then someone comes along behind you and picks up the qubits that were in the region S, right? If they were even able to partially tell what state you started off with, which code state row you started off with, then what this would violate, it would violate the partial no cloning theorem, right? Because the no cloning theorem says that I can't take a state, split it up into two parts and produce the same state again, at least not generically. And because when S is a correctable region, I can reproduce the exact density matrix from the rest of rho, from rho minus S, then rho S itself cannot contain any information about what state you originally started with. It's a very powerful idea, this is lo local indistinguishability, and it's gonna come up a couple times. There, of course, also is a proof of this um, from the Canille Laflamme conditions, which you know some people find more satisfactory. And the way you think about that is if E is any operator that only acts on that region, then if I was to measure trace of E rho, so that's just a measurement just on the qubits of that region, right? That you could write as trace E pi rho pi, because rho is a code word. You can just toss in pi's on either side of it. It doesn't change anything. Mathematically, use cyclicality of trace to move it around, then apply the Camille Laflamme condition and get some constant. So it tells you any measurement that only acts on that region, the answer is a predetermined constant regardless of which state row you start off with. That's a mathematically formal way of stating it, but the intuition about, I think, no cloning is much stronger and really gets at the heart of this. So it turns out the two statements we used, this one statement about local indistinguishability and the one statement about light cones is all we're going to be need. Like, at least that's like the core of what we're going to need to prove our statement. So let's get to a sketch of proof techniques. So before we start, let's think about sort of what does it mean to be a low energy state? What do those states look like? It's sort of not as clear, right? Um, in the classical case, if you take um, a set of constraints and you talk about the low energy constraints, that'd be like sort of you like physically violate some. You may flip a bit, you might violate some of the constraints. You flip another bit, you might violate some constraints. But what we know is that, in fact, the quantum world is very different than the classical world. There sort of are these also fractional violations. You could sort of take every state and you could sort of perturb it in like an L1 distance in the block sphere. That adds some error, right? But it's not an error that can be discreetly said as like you violated this Hamiltonian term, that Hamiltonian term, et cetera. The, the, the world of low energy states is a much, much more complicated too. So in the very core of this is the set of code states. They sit sort of in the middle. They're all the states of exact energy. And then, like I said, there are all these states where you take a code state and you perturb it slightly to get to a state row. So you just move it a little bit in the L1 distance. 
um, by most epsilon. And now the energy with every Hamiltonian term is bounded, total energy is in most epsilon. They can be generalized to something which I might call epsilon smooth states, so that the energy with every local Hamiltonian is at most epsilon. So no Hamiltonian term is violated a lot, but every Hamiltonian term is violated slightly. Or the other side is a very common Toro sort of error. You take a code word and you just completely destroy some epsilon fraction of the qubits, and you get some sort of low error state. And you can generalize this to some notion of combinatorial states where for some epsilon fraction of the Hamiltonian terms, you are completely in violation. And then there are all the states which do a little bit of both, right? You both simultaneously violate some combinatorial fraction and some smooth fraction, and they get very confusing. So that's why this world is a very complicated part of life. Okay, so if we are gonna prove lower bounds against all these states, we need to start somewhere. And the place where we're gonna start are these epsilon distance states, the first category I introduced states which are close to the code space in some physical distance, but are not exactly in it. Can we prove circular lower bounds of just those states? And if we do, does it give us any insight as to the rest of the space? And that's what we'll show in a second. So as a warm up, we're gonna prove circuit lower bounds for these, what maybe you might wanna call low distance states. Okay, so let's side be a state that is a distance delta from the code word. So there's a space of code, you know, sits a little bit outside, and we want to know what the circuit complexity of psi is. So a folklore result is that for any code state, rho, so any anything that you know satisfies all the checks, the circuit complexity scales with log d. You can prove this um, in a myriad of ways, but one thing that will happen is we're going to prove a circuit lower bound for low distance states in this warm up alone, and that will subsume it. So just take my word for it, or if you don't, you will have proved it again in just about two minutes. And for simplicity, for now, let's just consider pure states and circuits without ancillas. I promise you that all these statements that we're going to show do work when you, the states aren't pure and the circuits don't have ancillas. But for now, let's just consider this simplified manner. And here's the theorem we can prove. So if the square root of delta is less than the code rate, the relative rate, k over n, then for any state psi that's a distance delta from the code, the circuit complexity of sky of psi is logarithmic in the distance. So that's a fact that we're going to be able to easily show for all low distance states. And again, for, for just this warm up, let's consider just psi being pure and the circuit lower bound is on circuits without ancillas. The general results in our papers both consider mixed states and circuits with ancillas. So how do we show this theorem? Well, we're going to use all the tools we've built so far in one combination. So here's how we do it. So let's just define the, let's give the name rho to the state which is closest um, to psi, but is a code word. So that's where rho sits. And we're going to let theta be the encoded maximum mixed state. So, right, it's just the, um, it's like you encoded the maximum mixed state is one way to look at it, or you can just think about it as the mixture over all the states in there. This is like the uniform probability distribution over all states in the code. Okay. And now let R be a region, such the size of R is less than D, or it's a correctable region. Okay. And now let's notice two properties. The reduced density matrix of psi on that region R is delta close to the, to the reduced density matrix of rho on that region R. And that's just because the states are physically close. So a physical perturbation of one to the other means that on even a reduced density matrix that um, uh, is maintained, there's a sort of this monotonicity under um, tracing out regions. And the second part we're gonna use is local indistinguishability, which says that rho on a small, on a correctable region R is exactly equivalent to theta on that correctable region. Okay, and now we have to assume something for the purpose of contradiction about psi. So let's assume psi is the output of a circuit u, and u is a short depth. It's a depth t, where two to the t is less than v. So that's why this is an orange. This is going to be what our, we're going to assume for the purpose of contradiction. What that means, though, is if I apply u inverse or u dagger to psi, right, I get back the all zero. Or another way of saying that is for any qubit i to trace 
when I just look at the value of the i qubit of u dagger psi u, that is exactly equal to zero. Okay? And now let's do something fun. This is the big equation. That's basically the heart of the proof. So on one side here, we have zero, zero equals trace on the i qubit of u dagger psi u. This first equation, well, this is just actually just step two in disguise, right? This is just me rewriting step two. Okay. The next one, this equality, is where I've used the fact about light cones we talked about earlier. That if I'm just interested in the value of the i qubit, I could just think of psi, not, not just psi, but psi restricted to the light cone li. And now I get to use in the approximation, the delta approximation, given fact one, right? Because the light cone is going to have size less than d. Why? Because 2 to the t is less than d. So it itself is a correctable region. So fact one tells me that this is delta close to the value when I replace it with theta. And now I undo the same light code statement to get the result on the outside. And now if I look at the statement from the outside, what I get is that the i-th qubit of rotated theta. So if I take theta and I rotate it by the, by the unitary u, and I look at the i-th qubit, that thing is really close to zero, zero. It's delta close. Right? I just kind of put together all the facts I know all in one go. And what does that tell me? Well, if that qubit is really close to zero, zero, then the entropy of that rotated i qubit is not too high. It's at most square root delta, or more precisely, it's delta log one over delta, but let's just say it's root delta. Okay, but here's something fun. The total entropy of rotated theta, of u, of u dagger theta u, that's going to be equal to k, the rate of the code. Why? Because entropy doesn't change with unitary operations, and the entropy of theta is k because it's the maximally mixed state, the encoded maximally mixed state. And now using the trivial bound on entropy, that the entropy of a state is bounded by the entropy of the sum of it on smaller registers, I guess this equation five, that k is less than or equal to root delta times n. But this is precisely contradicts our assumption that root delta is less than k over n, right? So the, what is the only thing we assume? The thing is in orange, that two to the t is less than d. So this gives us a lower bound of log d. In fact, it gives us exactly log d, where the log is longer than base two. Right? So very simple proof. It tells us exactly what we need on how to prove circuit lower bounds to those states. Okay, kind of cool. But we look back at our picture and the state of low energy states and it's really, really big, right? It doesn't, this, this, this fact about one thing isn't really telling us about the rest. So how do we extend the argument from just the low distance states, which is just a small section of the state of low energy to all the low energy states? So what we're going to need to do is actually introduce something a bit more. So what we previously said was true just of any error correction code, anything that satisfies the Camille Laflamme condition. Now we're going to be a little specific and talk about LDPC stabilizer codes. So these are codes where all the checks are tensor products of constant number of Pauli states. And what we notice is that the code space is the set that satisfies all the, uh, all the checks. So every check CI psi equals psi. Um, but we can also define, just like the code space, we can define all the eigenspaces, and I'm going to call these DSs, where S is a string and it indicates which eigenspace I'm interested in thinking about, and it's just um, these sort of parallel eigens, uh, not parallel, excuse me, just uh, different subspaces, right? Where D0 is exactly the code space. And what one can show, and I won't do this uh, for the interest of time in this talk, but the local indistinguishability, the property that we showed was necessary for all error correcting codes. In the case of LDPC stabilizer codes, is a property held not only by the code space, but also by every eigenspace. Now, what the invariant, what rho is, the rho r, the invariant, that can vary depending upon which um, uh, eigenspace you're talking about. But within the eigenspace, rho r is an invariant whenever r is a correctable region. 
And this property is sort of what's going to be able to help us lift the idea from low distance states to all states. At a very high level, here's sort of what we're going to do. Any state can sort of be decomposed into its components into each of these eigenspaces, right? Um, it, uh, I can just sort of write it as, you know, based on the projection into each of the eigenspaces. Now, eigenspace by eigenspace, I'm going to be able to use the local indistinguishability argument in the same way as I did for the low distance states. And then I'm going to sort of add up all those things together. So I sort of have did the argument in the previous slide for just the, the eigenspace corresponding to s equals zero. And now I'm going to show that you can generalize this to all the eigenspaces sort of simultaneously and do the argument very cleanly up there. So here's just the statement of the main theorem once more that we're going to show. Okay, so one key idea we're going to use is something that is referred to as gentle measurement, which is the idea that if my measurement was guaranteed, uh, so if I'm going to make a measurement that succeeds with very high probability, then the act of performing the measurement is not very perturbative. Right? You can sort of think of it as like, imagine you had two vectors here and I was trying to measure the state that's right here. The measurement most of the time will just collapse the state from here to here, but in a very rare probability, it moves the state all the way back up, right? But the overall density matrix in the, in the normal density matrices was not very far from the original state to the post measurement state. And in fact, if the measurement was going to succeed with probability one minus epsilon, then the, the measurement is not too perturbative, it's only epsilon perturbative, sort of the formal notion. So if I have a state phi and n qubit now, I'm just gonna talk about mixed states. So uh, and u being a depth T circuit, here now it's gonna be able to be a circuit with ancillas um, that constructs phi. I can sort of define the energy per Hamiltonian term as epsilon i. Now, what does it mean for it to be a low energy state? It means that the sum of epsilon i is bounded by epsilon times the total number n. And we assume without lots of generality that the circuit U acts on n times two of the T qubits any more than you can just truncate it to find a simpler circuit because of light comes. Now given phi, I'm gonna define two states, one called little psi and one called capital psi. And all that's gonna be is I'm just gonna coherently measure each stabilize the term into n extra n scylla, or I'm going to incoherently measure. So coherently measure means I copy it, but I don't actually you know, perform the per perturbative measurement and capital phi is where I do perform the perturbative measurement. The high level idea is that little phi and capital phi are not going to be too far off because they only differ by perturbative measurements that are overall fairly gentle. So here's sort of, you can think about it is, the circuit U acted on ancilla and code qubits to build the state phi. Then I measure into this extra blue register the syndrome measurements to create psi, and then I incoherently measure that one more time to get capital psi. Now, since phi had a low depth circuit, then psi also has a low depth circuit, the depth is going to be T plus the fixed constant. The fixed constant here will depend on the LDPC ness of the code. So precisely the gentle measurement idea that I wanted to state, one way to write is in terms of fidelity. It says for any region R of the qubits, the fidelity between little psi on that region and capital psi on that region is very close to one. So it's nearly perfect, and it differs based on the sum over this number of, of the epsilons of the syndromes that are within that measurement. So if the regions have a lot of measurements in that region, in between them, then the fidelity could be far, but if there's very few measurements, then the fidelities can't differ by too much. And this is roughly the idea of gentle measurements. I'm not going to go into the technical details there. Oh, sorry, rough gentle measurements and commuting gentle measurements. Excuse me. So now, just like the previous example, we need to somehow introduce entropy. So recall that capital size, the incoherently measured version of phi. And so what we'll do is we'll introduce the completely low logical, completely decohering channel, which is basically the same. We just need to somehow create the version of the mixed state. And what that's exactly what I'm going to call it. I'm going to use the same Greek variable. So I'm going to define capital theta as applying this logically completely decoh 
here in channel to psi. So that gives me the entropy of theta is going to be at least k. And why did I do this? Why did I apply this co logically completely decohering channel? It's because I want to be able to make the statement in point two that for any correctable region R, that psi and theta look identical with respect to that region R. And here's where the local indistinguishability per eigenspace comes in. And both capital psi and theta are CQ state classical quantum states with the same distribution. Okay. So now let's put together the points. So the one was the fidelity between little psi and capital psi is nearly optimal. And the second one is that the, ex the density matrices on correctable regions look exact. So, and then the third point we're going to use is that since little psi was constructible by a constant up circuit, that if I was to undo that constant up circuit W, then I get back to the cube of zero. Right? And now here's what I do is I assume for contradiction that two to the T plus some constant is at most the distance. Then I get to the fidelity between the jth qubit of rotated psi and the jth qubit of rotated theta. Well, that's equivalent to the fidelity of the jth qubit of rotated of rotated psi only on the light cone and rotated theta only on the light cone, right? But that's a small correctable region. So this is one minus the sum over epsilon i, the summation being over all the syndrome measurements. So just exclude it for brevity. And this is a consequence of steps one and two. So now I have that the fidelity between the zero qubit and the j qubit of rotated theta is really close to one, right? It's um, one minus the sum over epsilon i, where epsilons are from the light cone of the j qubit. And what that sort of morally tells me is that in expectation, it's pretty um, close to zero, right? Because the expectation of this is on the order of two to the t times epsilon. So what I get is the entropy of the jth qubit for most qubits scales roughly like two to the t times epsilon at most. And then I do the same sort of argument I did previously. You know, I want to calculate the total entropy. Well, the total entropy is at least k, and I can bound it naively by the sum of the entropies on each of the qubits one after another. And I sort of put together the arguments, carry the two to the t's, you know, move stuff around. And I get order two to the two to the t and epsilon times log one over epsilon. Now, where the two to the t term comes that didn't exist in the previous argument, well, that comes from the fact that the light cones are size two to the t. We weren't able to do as clean an argument because we aren't able to bound the size of the light cone and show that each qubit doesn't affect more than two to the t times as many qubits as there exist. And so then you put this all together, you reverse the statement, and you get the bounds that we want in our main theorem. Some small cleanups later, you basically have the version that's in the paper. Um, and again, there are two assumptions, which is why t is greater than the min of two statements. One is log d, which is we had to assume for calculating the fidelities. And the second one is due to the bound on the rate. So we had to make two assumptions. Right? So log d came from two to the t is less than d. So argument recap, if you have an LDPC stabilized code and phi is a depth T state, then we're able to prove a lower bound. And the idea is roughly as follows. Since it's LDPC, you can measure all the terms in constant depth circuit. And then you use local indistinguishability to show on average that the maximally mixed state on a correctable region is close to psi in that region. Right? And then using the low depth nature of psi and phi, you bound the entropy of theta, which yields the contradiction because theta is both a high entropy state and a bounded entropy state. So that's all for this version of the talk. Um, for more open questions, please visit us during the ITCS section, and I look forward to seeing you. Bye.